Welcome, welcome. Uh, welcome to this uh, DCMI 2022 student, student uh, forum. Uh, my name is uh, Inchon Liu from Uppsala University in uh, Sweden. I just uh, changed my uh, affiliations uh, uh, recently. Um, before we get started, I'll give you an overview about this uh, student forum, how we uh, prepare this uh, program and uh, and the uh, and the overview of, of, about the uh, presentations. So, uh, as indicated in the call for uh, participation, uh, the student forum is uh, intended to provide an opportunity for the for the masters and uh, doctoral students to share their ideas of best practices. Uh, research in progress and all findings are related to the theme of the conference. Metadata in the uh, metadata in the innovation, uh, inclusivity, intelligence, and interoperability. So uh, during the summertime, we had an open call for the uh, presentation uh, proposals. Uh, we received we re received uh, quite a few. And uh, it went through a rigorous uh, reviewing uh, process. Uh, I'll give you more details uh, later. And for the student foreign award, uh, it comes with a 500 US dollars prize uh, uh, to cover the registration uh, fees and travel costs. And the winner will be announced at the closing uh, ceremony. And uh, this uh, program would not be possible with without uh, um, many uh, people's uh, uh, help. Uh, in particular, uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, professors uh, Sam Oh, uh, Jian Qin, and uh, Ma Xiazhen uh, for their uh, generous uh, support for this uh, uh, student uh, forum, particularly for uh, Sam Oh uh, to, uh, for offering the uh, prize uh, for this uh, student uh, forum. And of course, uh, I'm also supported by many colleagues in the field. And um, we uh, composed an expert committee for re reviewing the proposals. Uh, each uh, proposal has been reviewed by at least three um, experts uh, in, in our field. So I would like to thank um, uh, uh, Nisha for uh, technical support and all the logistics. And also uh, other colleagues uh, in the, the, the field of uh, knowledge organization, uh, Julia uh, Bula from University, uh, UBC uh, in Canada, uh, Ingong Choi from UIUC in the US, uh, Stephanie um, Havaka from UCD in Ireland, uh, Lu En from Wuhan University in China, Holly White from um, Curtin University in Australia, and uh, Yi Jun Wu from Louisiana State University uh, uh, in the US. And um, so thank you all for your uh, contribution and it has uh, made our uh, program as uh, exciting and rigorous as possible. So here we go. Uh, originally we uh, accepted five uh, presentations. Unfortunately, uh, one uh, had to uh, withdraw uh, due to due to uh, personal uh, reasons. So today uh, we have four uh, presentations. And um, so we'll go through this uh, uh, by this uh, order. And uh, because of the, the withdrawal of one present uh, a proposal, so we could be a little bit more uh, flexible about the time. But uh, yeah, uh, we need to keep our time so that um, um, yeah, at the most, uh, the presentation will be at the most, uh, originally uh, 10 minutes and we, we can extend it to about uh, 15 minutes uh, if possible or if uh, desired. And we all have uh, Q&A for about 10 minutes uh, for each uh, presentation. So I would encourage you to uh, submit your questions in the uh, chat or, um, you could also ask the, the questions um, uh, synchronously if you like. And so 
Okay, so the first presentation is um, entitled uh, Virtual Reunite for the Overseas Bronzes from Ancient uh, from ancient China in linked uh, open data environment by Xu Pei Wang from Sichuan University, uh, supervised by Professor uh, Feng Wang. So, Here we go. Uh, this is a pre-recorded uh, pre -recorded, uh, uh, presentation. So uh, please uh, give me a few minutes. Yes, thank you. Hello everyone. My name is Wang Shupei from Sichuan University. I'm glad to have the opportunity to be here today on behalf of our team. The subject of my presentation is Virtual Reunite for the Overseas Bronzes from Ancient China in Linked Open Data Environment. During the next 10 minutes, I shall share with you the outline of our study. In today's linked open data environment, the opening, sharing, serving, and utilizing of data is unavoidable topics. And semantic web technologies have long been seen as important tools for aggregation of digital collections, especially in the domain of cultural heritage. Many successful projects have been launched worldwide. And in China, meanwhile, much has been done too. For example, China's Digital Bronze Museum focuses on the integration of some classic Chinese bronze wares but with its limit on the semantic enrichment and operability of data. However, it brings us some inspirations that lots of elaborate Chinese bronzes were scattered overseas, and it would be a valuable work to bring them together virtually. Speaking of Chinese bronzewares, we often talk about their great value in history, culture, or other professional studies. Spanned for 3,000 years, Chinese Bronze Age has witnessed the birth of numerous bronze artifacts, and these bronzes are some of the most important pieces of ancient Chinese art. For example, this picture here shows a special bronze named Artisat. Collected by the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Artisat is a collection of bronzeware components which contains 14 different bronze works. And here we have some more pictures of classic Chinese bronzes, mostly from America and European museums. You may find that among the common containers, this you are here collected by the Freer Gallery of Art, and this one here collected by the Senushi Museum are quite interesting in their styling. This one is styled a human face with a dragon's body. And this one here it integrates tiger and human shapes along with complex patterns. And if you look at this map, you'll find that there are a number of museums in Europe and North America with Chinese bronze collections, like the Metropolitan Museum of Art and the British Museum. And compared to galleries, Museums usually provide more open data and more information about Chinese bronzes. That's the reason why we use data from museums as a foundation of our study. About the museum's data, we found that most museums make their images and basic data available under Creative Commons licenses. For instance, we found that most museums in the USA tend to use the Creative Commons Zero. Moreover, as we have shown on this page, scholars and institutions have published many catalogs of Chinese bronzes for research, provided lots of information about them. For example, the general study of Chinese bronzes was written by famous Chinese poet and archaeologist Meng Jiachen while he was teaching at the University of Chicago in the 1940s. And this catalog 
was written by Xu Qing Li, a famous Tsinghua University scholar. These catalogs are important information references for our study. Now I'd like to turn to the research problem of our study and how we are going to solve it. We're interested in how to aggregate classic bronze data from overseas museums website for virtually reunited Chinese bronze culture. To answer this question, we have done the following three things. First of all, we need to assess the existing format, volume, and structure of the bronze data in each museum so we can get a better understanding of the current state and coverage of the data. What I introduced earlier is about this part of the work. Then it is to study the common methodologies for data integration in linked open data environment. Finally, we proposed an aggregation framework suitable for the data modeling of the collection of Chinese overseas bronzes. Here are some opinions of scholars recently. Some important points are emphasized, including the possible problems and solutions that we might encounter during the aggregation. While we are designing our framework, there are some important specifications for reference and reuse. As we can see, Getty vocabularies are very important when discussing conceptual topics, especially in AAT Taiwan, for Chinese bronze wares, there are detailed phrases that can be reused to describe the type of a bronze. Here are the web pages of some Getty vocabulary phrases that we reused. Also, we refer to European Data Model and VRA to complete our framework. Here are the main classes and properties in our aggregation framework and it is still in the pilot stage. There are three dimensions we chose for the aggregation. As you can see in this graph, through the event-centric approach, we can integrate information about different bronzes through their creation time. And also, we can connect the bronzes information through their dis discovery place. Similarly, with the help of AAT Taiwan, as mentioned before, data from different museums can be aggregated together by their identical type. The last graph you see here is an aggregation demo. It shows a collection of bronzes and a work of bronzeware, which you can see in this right area. And the left of this graph demonstrates a special collection of bronzes, as I mentioned before, the other set also named Fan Jing in Chinese. In this graph, we chose two bronze wares in the outer set on display to reveal the relationship between the collection and its components. And if you look at this red circle here that shows the type of a bronze, you'll find that it connects the outer set and the other bronze ware that collected in the Museum of East Asian Art in Cologne. What's more, you can see that through the event creation and event discovery, more detailed information of the brand can be connected and shown. To conclusion, the purpose of our study is to realize virtual reunite for promoting Chinese brand culture around the world. And we proposed an aggregation framework for overseas Chinese brand data to achieve this goal. For the next step, this pilot project will develop an interoperable and systematic enriched platform to aggregate, retrieval, and visualize the overseas Chinese bronzes in linked open data environment. At last, I need to acknowledge that this work is part of the linked data powered indexing service for cultural heritage open data and supported by National Social Science Foundation of China. That brings me to the end of my presentation. Thanks for your time. Okay.
Thank you everyone for attending this uh, uh, section. Uh, we have uh, 25 participants, it's really encouraging. So, uh, so for the first presentation is about the uh, uh, special collection, the aggregation and interoperability issues in uh, organizing this uh, uh, cultural heritage uh, artifact. So with that note, yeah, we'll move on to the next, uh, sex, uh, next uh, presentation. And if, if we still have some time uh, at the end, then yeah, we can go back. Uh, uh, we could ask uh, the, uh, additional uh, questions uh, if you like, okay? Okay, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you. The next presentation is uh, a, met a metadata workflow for digitizing community archives by Heather Charlotte-Owen from uh, University of Rochester, Brandon Honick uh, from Pittsburgh Supercomputing uh, Center, and uh, Chao Yi Liu from Syracuse University. And this work is, super uh, is supervised by uh, Professor uh, Jian uh, Qin. Sorry, let me just share that one more time. Yeah, no problem. Take your time. Okay. Hey, hello everyone. Um, thank you so much for coming. Um, we want to wish you all um having a good day and that you've been enjoying the conference so far. My name is Heather. And I'm joined today with Brendan and Chao Yi, who um, also is known as Joy. We did this project at Syracuse University, but very recently, Brendan and I have graduated. Our presentation is a metadata workflow for digitizing community archives. So first, let us talk a little about the background of our project. Early last spring, Syracuse University, which is in the United States, was approached by the Theodore Burr Covered Bridge Resource Center, who was interested in digitizing some of their materials, and they weren't sure where to start. We were introduced to this project within our Digital Data and Services and Libraries course, which was taught by Dr. Chin, and we did some of the work on this project as part of this course. The Theodore Burr Covered Bridge Resource Center is located in Oxford Memorial Library, which is the home of the illustrious covered bridge builder Theodore Burr. It is located in Oxford, New York, which is a town in upstate New York in the United States. This resource center has a vast library of covered bridge related books, magazines, and newsletters from all the bridge societies in existence today. It also houses an extensive postcard, photograph, and slide collection dating back to the early 1950s. It's important to note that none of these resources are available online, which is something they are interested in changing. When Brendan, Joy, and I were first starting this project, we had to consider how we would approach it. We believe it is an undeniable fact that the world of cultural heritage is limited by invisible barriers of entry and needs to be more welcoming to community archives and culture keepers. The Theodore Burr Covered Bridge Resource Center is a very small community archive, but they are domain experts and these are their resources and this is their ambition and goal. Therefore, they should retain agency over this project. Brendan, Joy, and I approached this project with the idea that we would offer different options to the center, but we'll leave it up to the center to decide how to proceed. We considered finances, ease of use, and barriers of entry when it comes to the different options we provided. We also made our metadata form inoperable with New York Heritage's metadata dictionary to give them the option of joining New York Heritage if they were interested in doing so, but not making the choice for them. All right, I will be introducing the goals of our project. So based on these considerations Heather just mentioned, 
we listed the following goals for our project. Um, primarily, we wanted to create an interactive map to display the location and description of the cover bridges in a more user-friendly manner. We hope to maintain simplicity, simplicity of this process so that the volunteers or staffs who might not be familiar with metadata can easily understand and manage. We also consider the financial status of the center. So our goal is to use free resources if possible. We use the Google form to collect all the data, metadata we needed to create the Tableau map and the data model. The data modeling is our last goal, which is a follow step to improve information management to the collection. So here are the five steps of our project based on the goals. We first gathered an inventory list of all the types of resources to be digitized by the TBC BRC. We use several resources to help us with this process, which will be further mentioned in the deliverables. Next, we used a Google form to create a metadata record for each object. There are detailed instructions to how to submit to each question and examples to guide through. After the information is collected from this form, the staff could download the CSV file to a local computer to generate a Tableau map or upload it directly into a database management system. And throughout our entire project, we took notes of our steps and thoughts. So upon completion of it, we created a web page to upload our notes and reflections. Now we will move on to the deliverables we offered to the resource center. A considerable barrier of entry the resource center had was it was mostly run by volunteers who have either no or very little experience with metadata. We therefore wanted to create resources that would help volunteers create metadata records for their digitized objects. We made the metadata form inoperable with New York Heritage Metadata Dictionary to give them the choice of joining New York Heritage if they chose to do so. The metadata form we created has detailed instructions within the form, as well as links to vocabularies and authority control lists. Um, these detailed instructions would hopefully make the process of creating metadata as painless as possible, and also encourage consistency in how metadata is filled out as it would be completed by different volunteers. The form, however, can be edited which gives the center the agency to alter the form to suit their needs. We wanted to make sure that the agency retained control over what they were doing. We also created a video with detailed instructions on how to fill out the form. We can show you more of the form or the video in the Q&A section of this presentation if you are interested. Next, we'll uh, discuss the Tableau map that we created uh, based on the metadata form that Heather had previously covered. Tableau, if you're not familiar with it, is a, a free uh, data management software where you can upload uh, structured data, such as in the form of a, of a CSV file, and create visualizations with it. So in this case, we use the uh, longitude and latitudinal uh, data provided from the the form to populate a, a map, in this case of just the US, of where covered bridges are located. The benefit of using Tableau is that we can, or the user in this case, can filter uh, the different kinds of covered bridges displayed based on various facets that the metadata form describes. For example, the metadata form uh, has a section where uh, the TBC, BRC staff will say what a particular bridge uh, is constructed with, what kinds of trusses, which is the, the supports um, are involved. And this allows for uh, the, the map to be able to be drilled down into a particular subject area. Things like those trusses are predicated upon controlled vocabularies. In that case, the art and architecture thesaurus from Getty. Uh, the benefit of having a visualization like this is uh, apparent when you consider the traditional ways in which users might interact with libraries, which would be either searching in a database on a computer or in a card catalog, or also browsing uh, the physical bookshelves, the stacks as we call them. 
And that isn't as uh, apparent when you're working with digitized materials. There's no shelves that you can physically walk through. So having some kind of visualization like this, in this case, the map, allows users to interact with the data um, in a different way than just searching through uh, a database, for example. So before introducing our database design, I like to first clarify that the data model we used in this project. The relational data model is one of the most common methods to create a database. Its accuracy and simplicity is favored among different data models where data is saved in the minimum number of times in different tables and linked by a unique attribute referred as the primary key so that data creation read, update, and deletion steps can all be conducted in a data database management system, depending on um, whichever system you prefer. But this relational design is uh, a cross-shared concept among various systems. So, next page, please. <laughs> so as shown here, our concept conceptual model on the left and the logical model on the right represent two steps to create this relational database. The conceptual model comes first when we separated all the information into four different tables, which are the items, creators, collections, and geographic locations. The connection between the tables were um, roughly designed at first in the conceptual part. For example, like we um, set it as one collection might contain multiple items, so, but one item can belong to only one collection. So it is a multi to single relation. So based on what the metadata describes, the information can be stored in each particular table. And then in the logical data modeling, which is on the right, we defined which of these attributes are necessary, meaning that they cannot be null in a database. So shown here, they are labeled in bold. To link these tables in the way that we want, for instance, the example that I just mentioned, an item could belong to one collection, but one collection cannot line to items. We used a foreign key called the collection ID, which is the in the item table called FK1 to match the collection ID in the collection table. So by doing so, whenever uh, a staff is inserting a new item, its belonging collection may already exist. But since the item has its own unique identifier, this would not cause any error indicating that there are duplicate data. Next, we'll uh, show you one of our other deliverables from this project, the website. So we leveraged our experience with uh, web development to construct a web page that involves all of the descriptions of our projects, including various other deliverables, which include that metadata intake form, the Tableau map, or sample of it, uh, the model, and policy. We also include video and written descriptions of each section, a resource list in case uh, staff at the TBC BRC are interested in learning more about uh, metadata or ways that they can uh, boost their efforts in uh, digitizing their collections, as well as their own independent reflections of the project. Uh, this is important because we wanted to make our decision making uh, especially transparent. The purpose of documenting all of this is to, as Heather had mentioned earlier in this presentation, lower barriers to working with metadata, especially with for those that don't that aren't coming from like a formal background in it to make it accessible and to empower them to uh, describe and digitize their collections. Lastly, we have just a couple of closing statements about our project. Overall, metadata can be, as I said, a barrier to entry. Creating a workflow like this can allow more institutions to participate in the information science uh, field. As shown in the map, there are so many innovative ways that digital materials can be organized to help users discover new patterns and browse in new ways. The data model that Joy went over allows uh, the staff at the TBC BRC to create a database, which is great for longevity and reusability. Overall, we were really glad to work with this collection um, as Masters of, Information, of Library and Information Science students, because it allowed, it allowed us to uh, hone our own skills in working with metadata, as well as working with uh, an, an outside group 
as stakeholders in this project. We learned a lot about ourselves as librarians, and we were really appreciative to give back to the Central New York community. Thank you very much for uh, attending our presentation, and we look forward to any questions that you might have. Much, and uh, we can have more discussions uh, later when we finish our, our, all the presentations, if you like. Okay. So our next presentation is uh, comparing uh, MTI indexing at the uh, NLM to human indexing, a pilot study by Julia uh, Bullard, Eileen Chen, and uh, Dean Eustini. So the flow is yours, Eileen. Hi, and I'm going to share my screen in one second. Oh, wait. Okay, so everybody seeing this okay? Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's my pleasure to talk to you today about my directed research project on comparing the National Library of Medicine's medical text indexer with human indexing. I'm grateful to be joining this conference today from Surrey, BC, on the traditional and unceded territories of the Katsi, Semiamu, Kwantlen, and other Coast Salish peoples. My mentors for this project are Dr. Julia Bullard and Dean Justini, who have played a large part in the project and with whom I'm hoping to publish the findings from this study. So first things first, in the spirit of open scholarship, and uh, since I'll be using several acronyms during this brief presentation, I put the link to the project's OSF page at the bottom, and I will probably also drop this in the Zoom chat in a bit. Uh, so that's where you'll be able to find all the terms in a glossary there, so feel free to follow along if you wish. The Medical Text Indexer was developed by the National Library of Medicine to index articles for Mendline, the largest life science and biomedical database in the world. Prior to the MTI, the indexing process was done by humans with subject expertise, who would read through the entire papers and then come up with key terms to index the papers with. These terms are chosen from a hierarchical controlled vocabulary called the medical subject headings, also known as MESH. In 2002, the first version of the MTI was developed. This early version acted as a term recommender for human indexers, who still ultimately had to read the papers and make the ultimate call on uh, which MESH terms to use. And then in 2011, a semi-automated version called the MTI-FL came out. So this version sees the MTI processing the title and the abstract and then com coming up with a ranked list, with humans acting as curators of this output in a process called MTI-FL completion. And finally, last December, the NLM announced the newest version, the MTIA, which would fully automate odd medline indexing by mid-2022, which has already passed. So yes, all medline texts are currently being indexed by the MTIA. Um, we currently have limited information on how the MTIA works, but we know that it relies primarily on statistical methods to index main headings, and currently only has access to titles and abstracts rather than the full text of articles. It also uses machine learning to index subheadings, and the NLM has said that they hope to expand machine learning into other areas of indexing as well. The role of humans is now a little bit vague, and the NLM has stated on their FAQ page that human reviewers would perform quality checks on select citations. For example, and I quote, those involving genes and proteins, cases of known ambiguity, and clinical trials. So here are the research questions for this project. Uh, number one, what are the strengths and limitations of the MTI? Number two, what biases arise from its ranking mechanisms? And number three, what are the similarities and differences in the MTI's indexing of high-impact versus low-impact journals? Uh, the primary aim of the study uh, was to compare MTI indexing with human indexing, a subject on which there has been relatively little published literature. In addition to comparing between humans and the MTI, the study also compared indexing quality between high and low impact journals, 
uh, just as a way to peer into potential disparities between mainstream and underrepresented fields. With the study, uh, I looked for indexing errors and anomalies in the assignment of medical subject headings and check tags, which I will elaborate on later. For the sample, 20 articles published in the year 2000, which was two years before the earliest MTI was introduced, were used. Uh, the articles came from 20 journals on the AIM list, which is a recently discontinued PubMed subset of core biomedical and life science journals. 10 of these articles came from journals ranked with the top 20, 20 journal impact factors of the AIM list, and 10 of these articles came from journals ranked with the lowest impact factors. This was done as a convenient way to identify high impact versus low impact journals in order to investigate any differences in indexing quality. The interactive MTI is a publicly available online tool that allows users to input up to 10,000 characters of text based on which it generates a list of indexing terms. So this publicly available version is the MTI FL, which was recently retired in 2021, and it does come with different options for customizing output. So uh, this study ran the title and the abstract of each article through the MTI twice using two different modes. The first was the just the facts mode and the second was the full listing. So the first mode is one that gives a concise list of ranked terms, which we see as representing the MTI's final choices, while the full listing gives a long and detailed list of all the terms that it retrieved, including confidence scores for the rankings and notes on which pathways were taken to retrieve the terms. And that brings us to the results. Uh, so this study found that the MTI and human indexers assigned more indexing terms to articles from the high impact group than the low impact group. However, this difference was more drastic for the MTI, which assigned 6.4 more terms on average to the high JIF group. And in comparison, the human indexers only assigned 2.3 more terms to the same group on average. Uh, we can see here that the journals with the most MTI terms are fairly popular journals, most of which focus on general and internal medicine, cardiology, etc., while the journals with the least MTI terms fall under the categories of nursing or specialized care, um, more allied health fields. And uh, when we say mesh terms, this primarily includes main headings, subheadings, and check tags. The uh, interactive MTI doesn't yield many subheadings, so I only considered main headings and check tags in my analysis. And main headings are what make up the crux of mesh, and they are the terms that are most responsible for capturing the main ideas in an article. So of 174 main headings used by humans across the 20 articles, the MTI used uh, 80 of the same headings in the Just the Facts list, left 92 in the full listing only, and missed two altogether. And in 19 instances, the MTI used an acceptable synonym, which I define as terms listed in the see also field on the mesh browser or terms within two levels on the mesh tree. Uh, I was actually quite astonished that the MTI's retrieval rate was so high in the full listing uh, that it only missed two terms altogether. But the fact uh, that more than half of these relevant terms were not ranked highly enough for the just the facts list suggests that the ranking algorithms may need some improvement. Uh, of course, the human indexing lists aren't objectively ideal, um, as nothing can be, but the 20 article samples suggest that they are more accurate and more informative than the MTI overall, as the next section will delve into further. Uh, so here I have a closer example of what main heading issues would look like. For this article on nursing practice models and job satisfaction, the MTI missed three out of four human index main headings in its final list. The MTI term list failed to identify the article as being about nursing or about outcome assessment and ranked less important heading more highly than the genuinely relevant ones. More problematically, the MTI identified attention as an indexing term. Uh, according to the MeSH browser, attention is the act of heeding or taking notice or concentrating. In the abstract, however, the word only appears in this one instance, which is on the left of the slide, the concept of nursing practice models has attracted the attention of nursing administrators in the last decade. So clearly the MTI interpreted the word too literally when nothing else in the abstract suggests that attention is a focus in the article at all. Uh, within the study, we have found that such significant omissions, misusages, and misrankings are more common in articles on specialized care and social emotional concepts 
compared to articles on strictly medical topics. And then that brings us to the next section, uh, check tags. Check tags are a type of mesh used for classifying population characteristics present on nearly every article, which PubMed or Medline users can also use to filter their searches. So unlike main headings, there is little room for discrepancy regarding check tag usage. They're either accurate or they're not. And of the 72 check tags used by humans across the 20 articles, the MTI only got 38 right in the Just the Facts list and left 30 in the full listing and missed four altogether. So all four instances of total omissions, interestingly, had to do with the term aged. In these instances, the original human indexer assign a wide range of age check tags. For example, they would use infant, adolescent, adult, middle age, but only aged was somehow missed. So aged is, um, I believe, older adults over 65 years. And uh, this high rate of check tag omission can largely be explained by the MTI's lack of access to full text. It isn't always easy to identify all population characteristics accurately just from the abstract. However, the omission of aged in particular suggests an underlying bias that may be worth investigating. And speaking of biases, there is an obvious difference between how, MTI, uh, how male and female check tags are ranked. So there were six instances in which the MTI used both male and female check tags. In the full listing, the MTI assigned a high confidence score to male in all of these instances. For check tags, a difference of one to three places often means that both terms were ultimately included in the list anyway, as was the case here, which makes the difference fairly negligible on the surface. However, the fact that such an underlying bias exists in the rankings uh, could still be problematic and in a more nuanced way than I initially anticipated. So is the MTI actually more consistent at identifying male populations compared to female ones? I don't have a conclusive answer due to the scale of this pilot study, but you'll see here that the MTI can misuse both and for different reasons. In the first example above, the MTI seems to overcorrect by uh, taking the article with female and pregnancy, even though the abstract only mentions pregnancy in passing. The MTI likely recognized the word pregnancy first and then assumed by default that the article must be about women only, as is consistent with uh, what a human indexer would do if pregnancy really was a relevant check take, but it's not in this case. And uh, in the second example, the bias for male population seems to come into play. The article was on a women abuse screening tool and is obviously about women. The male was included as a check take and ranked more highly than female. This is possibly because the genders of the 20 family physicians who interacted with the female patients in this article weren't specified, but it's still hard to justify the use of male check tag in this case of ambiguity. And in the third example, the MTI assumed that a population consisted of both sexes, probably because the population of 765 was large enough that it was likely to have included both men and women, which appears appropriate in this instance. And that brings us to the conclusion. So we found that there was an apparent difference in the number of indexing terms, as well as indexing accuracy between the high impact and low impact groups, the better indexing of more terms for the high GIF group. The MTI's retrieval rate for human index terms was high in the full listing, but the fact that just under half of these main headings uh, and check tags made it to the final list suggests that the ranking mechanisms have much room for improvement. The check take rankings and emissions also reflect a certain bias for male populations that are not aged. And lastly, to build onto the first point about mesh accuracy, we also noticed that the MTI use medical and operationalizable terms more frequently and more accurately than social and emotional concepts. And this is in part because there are simply fewer mesh terms for social and emotional concepts that the MTI can choose from. But there were still several instances of obvious emissions and misusages. So one major problem acknowledged by the NLM's indexing team itself is that limiting the MTI group to processing title and abstract only results in less accurate check takes. And on its indexing FAQ page, the NLM did state that, uh, that it hopes to work towards full text processing, but an exact date of information has not yet been announced. In the meantime, we believe it's crucial for the NLM to increase the extent of indexer review for MTI output rather than limit index involvement to select article types and random quality checks. 
In fact, we have been tracking indexing errors and anomalies in recently indexed articles on Medline and have noticed that several of the issues identified in this pilot study continue to be a problem in current indexing, both check tags and main headings. Uh, you can find a copy of the spreadsheet used in the OSF link as well. And thus, PubMed and Medline end users are encouraged to report indexing errors to the NLM through their support center portal, as mentioned in the NLM's indexing fact FAQ page. And if you spot anything noteworthy, I would also be happy to receive any emails on it as part of our ongoing efforts to track indexing issues. Uh, regarding limitations, as this is a pilot study, the small sample comes from a limited selection of journals that can't represent all articles indexed in Medline and PubMed. The use of journal impact factors is also not the most reliable way of determining a journal's impact or ensuring that a wide variety of subject areas are represented. In a larger scale study, stratified sampling based on subject area may be a good idea. The interactive MTI tool I used is also not the same as the current MTIA that the NLM uses for indexing. So not all the problems identified in this study are necessarily applicable to current indexing. In the future, I hope to collaborate with my two mentors, Dr. Bowler and Dean Justini, to conduct a more comprehensive study with greater indexer and subject expert involvement. We will continue to monitor uh, indexing biases and errors and hope to more systematically compare current MTI indexing with human indexing standards in the past. And then the preferences. And that brings us to the end. Uh, any questions? Thank you very much for a great presentation. Good. Thank you very much. And um, Good luck for your future work. If you are, yeah, if you have more questions about information retrieval and mesh terms, uh, get in touch with me. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next, our presentation is entitled Makers, uh, Make Space and Metadata Schema by um, Katie Colson and Cora Guffrey. Uh, this is a study from EYUC in the US, uh, supervised by uh, Dr. Ingyong Choi. And the floor is yours. Okay, great. <laughs> um, if you'll just give me a second. Yep. All right, of course it paused. I'm on two monitors, so it doesn't want to automatically share. <laughs> okay, can everybody see everything? We're all good? Uh, yes. Okay, great. Okay, so hello everyone. I'm so glad you were able to be here today. Um, my name is Katie Fulton. I am currently in my final year of my master's degree in library science at UIUC. Um, I'm originally from Northern Idaho and I'm currently living here in Illinois. Uh, I became interested in this project because I'm focusing on knowledge organization and creating trust information in my studies. I want to do this area in my career and I've previously worked in cataloging and I was excited to explore a new area. Hi, everybody. I'm Cora Godfrey. Uh, I'm from Austin, Texas, and I just graduated from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign this past May. Um, I currently live in Austin, and I am working for the University of Texas at Austin in their interlibrary loan department. We created a makerspace metadata schema, and we're going to tell you all about it today. Cool. Oh. Yeah. So uh, for this project, we worked with our on-campus makerspace, the Champaign-Urbana Fab Lab, which from here on out, we will refer to as the Fab Lab. A makerspace is generally understood to be a community-based workshop where people come and use tools and resources that aren't accessible to them otherwise to do creative projects. Some examples of this would be uh, sewing clothing, you know, using a sewing machine that was made available to them. Uh, printing and designing a 3D model with a 3D printer, and even using a printing press. We got to see all the little plates that go into that. It was really, really cool. Makerspace resources at our Makerspace live digitally, uh, and resources like this are unique from their traditional predecessors that we've traditionally cataloged within the field. Resources like this generally are only growing in number, and there's not a guide for how to keep track of them and make them accessible for the public. And there's even less options 
for hosting them. As grad students with a background in cataloging, we really wanted to bring that perspective to the Fab Labs resources as we organized them. So during this presentation, we're going to talk about how we approached this project. We began with a literature review, then we did a content analysis of their existing resources. And then we're gonna talk about how we created our organization system based on their specific needs and goals. So the Fab Labs main issue is findability. They're currently using Google Drive to store and organize all their resources, but it is not meeting their needs. It's difficult to find a specific resource and there is no public friendly way to browse, browse their connection. Question, excuse me. So Google Drive search function is very limited and it often results in a burying of resources in folders or duplication of those resources. The Fab Lab wants their resources to be publicly accessible and browsable by their patrons, which is not a natural feature of Google Drive. So to aid them, we decided to develop an organizational schema that would guide them on how to describe their resources and then would increase findability by allowing multiple access points in those descriptions. This would also help create an ordered structure that would make their collection more accessible and browsable. So based on the Fab Lab's particular needs, we also aim to make this easy to use. Um, we wanted this to be an easy step to add into their workflow, not something that would be you know, overcomplicate things or give them a lot more work to do. So our methodology for approaching this project, we started by doing a literature review of makerspaces, you know, to get a lay of the land. And there's a lot of literature on how to start your makerspace. A lot of it's aimed at, you know, public schools, you know, for the um, little elementary students. But there's not a lot on the longevity of it, the suspension of makerspaces, and there's even less on how to organize those resources and materials. This gap in the literature really told us that our project was going to be a novel one and that what we were doing would have an application to the wider makerspace community. So our next step was to do a content analysis of the Fab Labs resources. We utilize this tool called Taget. And Taget is an internet-based resource that allows you to upload PDFs and highlight text to create lists of tags. However, during this process, we faced several limitations. Um, one of those being our time constraint. We didn't have a ton of time to do this. Another being Taget's limitations itself. You could only upload um, text-based resources to Taget which really uh, ruled out several of the Fab Labs teaching materials. They do workshops and summer camps using PowerPoints and videos, and we were unable to upload those to Taget to do content analysis with. As well, on top of the variety of resources that the Fab Lab has, they also have a huge number of them. So in order to combat this, we sampled representative resources we focus on their tutorial resources, which for the most part were text-based. And to do this, we split it up between Katie and I, I took half, she took half. And we went through the resources and picked out patterns that we saw that we thought would make good tags. Um, and once we had our indiv individual lists, we came together and we merged them. And that became the first draft of our schema properties. Knowing that our content analysis was pretty limited in its scope, when we were developing our schema, we wanted to make sure we were accounting for that um, variety in resources, as well as develop a solution that was flexible enough to keep up with the continually changing space. So we narrowed our terms down to a schema of 14 properties. Um, to, support that, to support our schema, we created three controlled vocabularies, and we described this schema in a data dictionary, which Cora will talk about in a minute. Uh, to guide our property selection and terminology, we looked to existing schemas such as Dublin Core or schema.org. And overall, we selected terms based on our content analysis, the needs of the Fab Lab, and common terms in existing schemas. So for example, we decided on the property audience because the target audience for a resource was often an element described in the resource itself or part of the existing organization of the folders in the drive or part of the title. So we developed a controlled vocabulary to standardize the language they were using around this element. Um, they work with such a variety of groups that they had a great variety of different terms to describe those groups. And those groups were often quite similar. To create our vocabulary, we grouped together similar audiences, to create a cohesive list of terms that would describe all the target audience that the Fab Lab would be dealing with, and that would make, make sense to both staff and patrons. 
So these 14 properties were not intended to be comprehensive, but to describe the core elements of these items. We decided to go with a simple core set of terms to create a standard that would be immediately useful to the fab law. So we also, we also developed two optional sub-properties that could be used to further refine these descriptions if the fab lab chose to expand the metadata once the basic record was in place. We also made only four of our properties required. They are creator, title, subject, and type. Uh, we felt these were absolutely essential and that a record should not exist without them. But a record with all of our properties would be fully if simply described to the level that it would aid the fab labs both for their resources. So in order to manifest our schema, we chose to do a data dictionary that completely explained how to use everything we had, uh, you know, to take that pressure off of the Fab Lab staff. When we were developing our data dictionary, we really based ours on the premise data dictionary, just because that data dictionary is so comprehensive and explains quite literally everything. Um, so we started ours with an introduction that went about defining our most important terms that we thought were integral for the Fab Lab to understand in order to make use of this. Um, and we really had to figure out how to explain everything we meant when we had different backgrounds of information um, between us and between the Fab Lab staff. So we focused on making all of our terms and information as accessible to them as possible. But we didn't want to go overboard on all of our explanation, so we capped our introduction at three pages. Um, so for each property, we provided a definition, as well as guidelines for use, value formatting, and an example or two on what that might look like when you are using it. Part of this was deciding which properties would or would not be repeatable, as well as which ones would or would not be mandatory in order to create that minimum description record of an item. What we also decided to include a rationale on why we chose to include these properties, you know, just a little explanation on why we thought it was important, as well as any usage notes that we thought the Fab Lab staff might need in order to navigate using this for the first time. At the time of our schema's creation, we had planned for it to be implemented in the Google Drive. But as I was re resuming this project this semester, the plan has shifted to focus on upgrading the Fab Lab's existing website. And then and our schema will now be used on that website, which will be the main portal for both staff and patrons to access the Fab Lab resources. So this change is exactly why we designed the schema to be simple and flexible. Makerspaces are relatively new, and changeability is an essential part of their makeup. They're constantly shifting space. So we planned and allowed for these sudden changes of direction to come up as goals, staff, access, resources, what have you shifted and changed over time. So with the website as our main platform now, we are using our schema to create an information architecture for the website, um, i.e. this will be what properties or values will be in the global menu or a local menu or only exist only as a tag. And our schema still works in this situation because we focused on core terms and did not rely on a particular platform. In the future, we want to work on interoperability amongst makerspaces. Uh, ideally, one day we want to utilize linked data um, to mirror the larger trends in our field. So what we've learned. Um, one thing that really stood out to me in working on this project was that we were working to create something based on someone's particular need, and that was kind of a new experience. Um, previously, I've worked as a cataloger dealing with individual item description, and now we're not just describing a record, we a record, we had to negotiate how to describe a record. We had to um, sort of translate the Fab Lab's needs into cataloging metadata practice. And then we had to communicate and translate that practice to the Fab Lab, <laughs> which was definitely a new experience and definitely a skill I'm very glad to have practiced here. Yeah, so for me, um, I think the biggest thing that I learned was um, what happens when you have that difference in background knowledge? So we were coming from a cataloging perspective, which is very, very different than what the Fab Lab staff, you know, has in their repertoire. They're focused on making this space smooth and usable for other people. Um, whereas we just didn't know the ins and outs, the day to day of makerspaces. And I remember the first time I stepped inside that Fab Lab, um, it was the dead of Illinois winter. <laughs> It was so cold and I remember stepping inside and instantly like, oh, this place is alive. 
Um, and when we were developing that scheme, this schema, I really, we wanted to be true to that sense of life that the makerspace has and having to negotiate that based on the Fab Lab's needs and what they understood about their space and what we understood about our knowledge was just really different and really exciting. So uh, in our conclusion, we learned that makerspaces as a newer part of the field just don't have cataloging guidelines and struggle to adapt existing ones to their resources because those resources are so unique. Um, with our case study, we want to offer an alternative solution that is designed specifically for these kinds of resources and would account for a space that is constantly evolving so that they could easily work with makerspaces. Application of metadata like this allows for patron search and discovery, you know, people who are coming in and perhaps don't know exactly what they want to work on, but have a general idea that search and discovery is so important. And it helps improve the lives of the Fab Lab and makerspace staff in general who are running such wonderful spaces. This study really showed us the deficit in guidelines when it comes to organizing unconventional resources. And we really hope that our research prompts more consideration of cataloging in non-traditional spaces within the information science field. So finally, we would like to thank our advisor on this project, Dr. Inkyung Che, for her support and guidance. We'd also like to thank Chang Wang Ko, Amanda, and Emily at the Fab Lab for their willingness to work with us. And thank you all for listening. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for a great uh, presentation. That's it. Injang, thank you very much for your wonderful work in organizing this. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Sam. Yeah. So that's it. Uh, thank you, everyone. And um, that's uh, the DCMI 2022 uh, Student Forum. Um, I'm Injang Liu from uh, Uppsala, <laughs> Uppsala University in Sweden. And thank you, everyone, for your participation. And uh, see you next year. Thank you. Bye-bye.